Tell me uh, uh, a bit about what open science as a term means, how you define it, and what your involvement in it is. Just in a few sentences, not the whole... Not the whole spiel. Yeah. Um, so, open science as a term is a little bit challenging because it's very broad. It covers an awful lot of um, different things which many people are very passionate about. Um, so I tend to define it as being the movement of people who are interested in um, improving access to um, the underlying pieces of science, of the research process. Um, so it's about, it includes things like open access, open notebook science, um, open process, open publication, but it's, it's bigger than all of those things and as a result of that it's very difficult for it to describe it as a single thing. But as, but as a group of, group of people who are working to open up access to different parts of the research process. Specifically in your own actual work in terms of science, what aspects of the open science thing do you practice as a scientist? So, I actually came to this from a slightly, slightly strange angle, but what we, where we started, in fact, was with lab notebooks, electronic lab notebooks. Um, and it was actually a completely accidental process that we made the decision to actually completely open up the laboratory notebook um, that we had online. Um, and it wasn't until after we'd made that decision that I thought this was kind of a radical thing and started looking um, to see whether other people were doing it, which is where I came across a lot of people like John claude Bradley, Peter Murray Rust and others like that. So we actually started with Open Notebook Science, the sort of the completely radical end of the thing. So you, my, though my lab notebooks are, no, are far from perfect and far from, far from um, brilliant, they, when they get recorded, they go online, anyone can look at them. And because sort of I've been pushing the extreme agenda at that end of the spectrum, then things like um, try to publish in open access venues, um, arguing for uh, copyright reform, um, public access to science, all more or less follows naturally from the sort of the view that if we're pushing <laughs> at the extreme end, then the rest of it is things that we'll try and do as far as possible. So we try and do most things, some of them we may do better than others. How would you uh, explain to a fellow researcher that you met who knew nothing about this stuff, about all of this, why you're doing it, what's the benefits and all that, and you know, say you're just meeting over lunch, so you've got a short pitch to make? Yep. Yeah. So, well, so I'll start with kind of the definitions. Is, um, open notebook science was a t term coined by Jean-Claude Bradley about, I guess, getting on for four years ago now um, in his work looking for malaria. Um, and he has a nice sort of, um, sort of pitch line that tries to explain what the, the philosophy is, which is there's no insider information. The record that exists is made available, um, and that's the end of the story. Now, what that means in practice is that you have a lab notebook that is some sort of web-based system. Um, Jean-Claude Bradley happens to use a wiki. Um, we use a thing system um, that's based on a blog. Others have used um, PDF documents that they post to the web. Um, the, the mechanisms doesn't, doesn't matter, but it has, has to be something that can go on the web. And for it to be sort of pure open notebook science in, 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 the, in the, the core sense by which we mean it, it has to be the primary record made available to the public at the same time as you make it available to yourself. Um, there are various variants of pulling back from that where people might either not make everything available, um, there are various reasons why that might be the case from concerns about intellectual property to concerns about privacy or, or other personal information. Um, there are people who make an effort to record everything but don't release it immediately but will release it after some form of delay. Um, and those are all things that we'd see as sort of moving in the, in the right direction but not, but not sort of the, the full-blown full -blown approach. It's quite a scary thing to do. I mean, you're putting 
the raw record of the research you're doing online, um, complete with all the mistakes you make, all the ideas that you haven't thought through yet, um, and, and arguably putting up stuff that you haven't thought through yet and perhaps isn't ready for public consumption. And so when I talk to people about this, it's very simple to describe what it is. Lab notebook online as it's recorded. Um, the rationale behind that, people uh, find a little bit more difficult to take. Um, my view is, is kind of twofold, or maybe threefold. One is that by exposing the working of your lab notebook, it's a powerful motivator to keep a better record because people might be looking at it. Um, it's also a great way of improving the record, um, the standards of recording within a group because you know you can rely on each other to, to have that information. And again, there's that motivation of the group to, to keep a better record. As you step up from that level, then you have the opportunity for um, serendipitous collaboration, so coming across people um, by accident, via Google searches, these kind of things. Um, and those are the kind of things you can't predict, can't, can't see in advance. And they're still rare. I mean, don't be blunt about this. It's, um, there aren't that many people who are looking for collaborators using Google and expecting to find laboratory notebooks. So even the people who are looking wouldn't necessarily know what to do when they landed there. But we've had, I've had a couple of people come to me because our lab notebooks have, have come up high enough on a Google search where they've been looking for papers, for information on something, and they've just wanted to ask a question about a technique or a process. Had a couple of examples of that. Um, certainly Jean-Claude Bradley has had many people offer to collaborate and contribute to his projects. Um, and then the other thing is that by doing this, by making some sort of commitment to the sense you've got things in public, um, then there is a community around this and that community is supportive and um, people are willing to help because they see that you've been, you know, that you're committed to an open process. So there again, there are a couple of examples where one of this group of people have said, can anyone help us with this? And, you know, and in a matter of hours, there's been a response. Um, and then again, there are examples of, of that kind of, because you've got credibility, you start to gain, um, gain the, the, the trust of the community. So the simple, the, sim the really simple pitch is, if it's easy to do, then you're not losing anything in most cases. And what you're gaining is the stuff that's unpredictable that you never would have guessed at. And that's where all the interesting science is. It's always in the, the bits you didn't expect. Um, of course, it's, the caveat is it's not zero cost. It takes an effort to put it up there. There's work involved. And it's still not something I'd necessarily recommend to anyone just because it's, there's a commitment to be made to put the work in. Um, and there are risks. Um, and I think those risks are misunderstood and um, over-exaggerated, but they do exist. Um, but then I think the flip side of that is, of course, you we never take understand or think about the risks of not making things available. Um, and that goes all the way from publication systems where things are not made available and can lead to projects not happening or projects happening that shouldn't have happened but all the way through to the connection you don't make that doesn't solve the problem that would you know, open up the next sort of research area for you. So that's kind of the, the key thing is opening yourself up to unexpected contributions. That's the real value. So um, you've talked about um, that it takes basically resource, you know, time and effort, someone to set up the, the blog or the wiki or whatever it is, all that stuff. So um, what would you say, the, the next thing is the elevator pitch, as they call it, to someone who's say, a senior government policy maker, mm -hmm. someone who's a senior person in a funding body, you've got them for five minutes in an elevator, they're the ones that might be able to help with that. Uh, what's your pitch to them? The simple pitch is, our key 
need is to maximise the return on investment. That means effective communication, it means effective archival, and it means supporting the efficient management of information within laboratories themselves. Taking an open notebook approach or a partial open notebook approach delivers on every level. It makes material available even if it isn't eventually formally published. It maximises the archival possibilities in a, in a, at least in the cheapest way you can by placing stuff on the web where there are archival mechanisms. It's not perfect, but it's, but it's the cheapest way to, to make progress on that. And it improves the management of data within a laboratory by providing a centralised place with a social structure around that that helps to encourage best practice. So you're delivering the return on investment for capturing, effective capture of the research that you're investing in at the laboratory level, at the archival level and at the communication level.